In this video, we're going to have a look at the thyroid gland and the hormones that the thyroid gland produces. We're going to take a look at how those thyroid hormones are produced, where they act in the body and what they do, and also what stimulates their production and their release. Now, the first thing we need to talk about is the thyroid gland itself. Now, there's going to be another video on the anatomy of the thyroid gland, but we need to be able to identify where it is. First thing is that if you take your windpipe or your trachea, and you were to get your finger and you run your finger down the anterior aspect of your windpipe, you would feel your Adam's apple. Now, this is known as your laryngeal prominence, and it's made up of laryngeal cartilage. Now, remember, both males and females have an Adam's apple. Why? Well, it's just the laryngeal prominence. It's more prominent in males because it's a secondary sexual characteristic, and testosterone makes it more pronounced in its size. So if you were to feel your Adam's apple, and then you were to continue down and feel what's called your suprasternal notch, which is this part right here, between your Adam's apple and your suprasternal notch is where your thyroid is located. And your thyroid wraps around your trachea, and think about it as though it looks like a butterfly with the two wings, those two wings are the two lobes of the thyroid gland, hugging the anterior aspect of the trachea, anterior and lateral. Now, I want to talk about if we were to go into that thyroid gland and have a look at the cells and the tissue of the thyroid gland. So, you need to be aware that if you were to look histologically into the thyroid, you'll find that there are these little pools like this, in which you've got a single layer of epithelial cells surrounding this hollow lumen. So, this is the lumen, and this is the single layer of cells, and you've got many, many, many of these within the thyroid. These are the functional units of the thyroid, and what you'll find is that these cells, this single layer of cells, are called follicular cells. Follicular cells, also known as thyrocytes. Thyrocytes. All right, in this lumen right here, there is actually a fluid. This fluid is called colloid. And it's within this colloid that we produce thyroid hormone. But we need a couple of things to come together here in the colloid to produce thyroid hormone. Now, it's two major things that need to come together for this to happen. The first thing you need is iodine. The second thing you need is thyroglobulin. So you need iodine and thyroglobulin to come together in this colloid to produce thyroid hormone. How does this work? Well, let's first start with the iodine. Iodine is the 53rd, so let's write it over here. Iodine is the 53rd atom in the periodic table which means it's quite heavy, and it's one of the heaviest atoms that we would ingest and utilize metabolically for the human body. 53rd atom on the periodic table, it is found within many different types of foodstuffs. So in high quantities, you'll find it in eggs, you'll find it in dairy, you'll find it in seafood, and you'll find it in various plants and vegetables. How do they get it? Well, the animals need to ingest it themselves, and it ultimately comes from the soil. So what you'll find is that certain areas of the world that have high quantities of iodine in soil means that the foodstuffs will also have high quantities of iodine in it. But there are many places around the world where iodine is not rich in the soil and therefore not rich in the foods, which means that some individuals may be limited to the amount of iodine they ingest. How much iodine do we need per day? Well, if you're around about a 70 kilogram adult, in a 24-hour period, you need 150 micrograms of iodine. 150 micrograms per day is the quantity of iodine that you need to remain or to maintain healthy function of the thyroid gland to produce thyroid hormone. Now, 150 micrograms a day, what's that? That's around about a sixth of a gram. But luckily for us, our thyroid maintains a pool of iodine, and there's actually around about 8,000 micrograms of iodine in the form of iodide 
stored within the thyroid, which is what? Around about 50 days worth of storage. So we've got around about 50 days of backup iodine available, which is great, just in case. All right, so we've got our iodine, we've ingested it through our foodstuffs, the body turns it into iodide, and iodide is a charged form. So iodine is the non-charged form that you'll see on the periodic table, which you'll see is just I. It turns into iodide within the body, which is I negative. Now you know, you already know that when you ingest sodium, when you ingest calcium, all these types of things, often you'll ingest them in a way in which they don't possess their charge, but once it's entered physiological uh, fluids, it will change its particular charge. And so for example, sodium becomes Na+, plus, chloride becomes Cl negative. I've already recorded a video discussing how this occurs. So when we ingest iodine, it turns into iodide, I negative. And what happens is, this is readily absorbed through our gastrointestinal tract, and it tends to accumulate and concentrate in the thyroid gland. So the thyroid gland is the only part of the body that's actually going to use iodide. Now, it absorbs it. So there's going to be blood vessels all around here, right? So you're going to have blood vessels all around here. And so the iodide, which is absorbed through the gastrointestinal tract, will float through the bloodstream. It will come out of the bloodstream into the extracellular fluid, and it will be taken up by these follicular cells on this basal side. So the iodide is taken up. Let's draw it over here. Iodide is taken up on the basal side of these cells, taken in through a sodium iodide symporter. What that means is, if that's the cell, right, you're gonna have sodium iodide, and they're both taken in together through a sodium iodide symporter, okay? Iodide, uh, sodium is going down its concentration gradient, taking iodide with it. Now it's inside the follicular cells, and then from there, iodide can diffuse via the apical membrane into that colloid. So now we have iodide here within the colloid. Now the iodide needs to become oxidized. What does that mean? Oxidized means it loses electrons. Have you ever heard of LEO? L-E-O, loss of electrons is oxidization. Loss of electrons is oxidization. And iodide is oxidized by hydrogen peroxide, H2O2, right? Iodide is oxidized by hydrogen peroxide. And you may think, isn't that poisonous to us? Isn't that dangerous? Well, remember that even though our body produces what we call these free radicals or oxidative species, that yes, in abundance, they can be damaging, and that's called oxidative stress, but we do require these oxidative species f to maintain health to a certain degree, so it actually promotes immune function, and in this case, hydrogen peroxide is used to oxidize iodide. And then, once it's oxidized, iodide is available and ready for use. Now, what does the iodide do once it's been oxidized in this colloid? Well, it binds to thyroglobulin. So the thyroglobulin is produced and is stored here in this colloid, and we'll write thyroglobulin as Tg. So we've got iodide and thyroglobulin here in the colloid. They need to come together, and this coming together is uh, supported through an enzyme called a peroxidase. So peroxidase comes along, helps them come together, and what you'll find is this. So when iodide comes together with thyroglobulin, you produce a couple of molecules. So I want to highlight what these molecules are. So if iodide come together with thyroglobulin, they can produce, so remember, with, with the help of an enzyme, which is a peroxidase, it can produce mono, which means one, iodo, Tyrosine, mono iodo tyrosine. Mono means one, iodo is the iodine, tyrosine is referring to the tyrosine subunit within the thyroglobulin. Thyroglobulin is a very big protein. It's around about, I think it's about 660 kilodaltons in size. Quite a big protein. 
right? and it has numerous tyrosine residues, which is an amino acid within that protein. So proteins are just accumulations of amino acids. There's multiple, I think there can be up to 160 tyrosine amino acids within a single thyroglobulin. But if you've only got one iodine attached to this thyroglobulin, it's called monoiodotyrosine. And that's sometimes written as MIT. If you have two iodine binding to the tyrosine, two iodine, and uh, so binding to the thyroglobulin, what you get then is diiodotyrosine, which is written as DIT, right? So you can produce, if you've got two iodine binding to a thyroglobulin, two, that's diiodotyrosine. If you've got one binding, that's monoiodine tyrosine. They're actually inert, these two things. They're here now, they've accumulated. In this colloid, we've got MIT and DIT, but they're inert, they don't do anything. So they need to be turned into something else. Well, what do they turn into? Well, if you take two diiodotyrosine, if you take a DIT, and bind it with the DIT, you've got two IDO plus two IDO gives you four IDO. That gives you something called tetra iodo. Now it's not tyrosine, it's thyronine. Thyronine. Tetra meaning four, iodo, thyronine. But it's not called that. It's a ridiculous name. We just call it thyroxine. Thyroxine. And we write thyroxine as T4. This T4 or thyroxine is one of the thyroid hormones. T4 thyroxine, one of the thyroid hormones. We actually produce, or we probably have it stored within our thyroid gland around about 5,000 micrograms of that, which is about five grams. We have about five grams of thyroxine stored. Now our uh, thyroid itself is only about 20 grams, okay? So we've got a huge amount of backup thyroxine available. And again, if you think about that, I said iodine, we've got about 50 days backup. If we think about this, well, that's around about 50 days as well. We only use about 1% every day of our thyroxine that we've got stored in our thyroid gland. So we've got all this backup available. Okay, so that's the first thyroid hormone that's produced. The second thyroid hormone that's produced is if we take a monoiodotyrosine and bind it with a diiodotyrosine, and that's one plus two gives us three. That then gives us a triiodothyronine. Triiodothyronine, and the triiodothyronine is known as T3 because there's three, and that is the other thyroid hormone. Now in actual fact, these are the two only thyroid hormones that we need to look at. Now there's another thyroid hormone that's produced called calcitonin, but we're not going to talk about calcitonin today. So the two thyroid hormones that are produced are T3 and T4. T4, so of all the thyroid hormone that's produced, 80% of it is T4, and obviously 20% of it is T3. So the majority is T4. However, so that means that now in here we've got T4, T3, and what happens is because the thyroid gland is a gland, it's part of the endocrine system. Endocrine means that it's going to release chemicals called hormones into the bloodstream, and these hormones will travel all throughout the body to have their effect. So when we release T4 and T3 into the bloodstream, the majority is T4, but T4 doesn't necessarily do anything. T4 actually needs to be turned into T3 in order for it to have an effect. So T4 needs to be turned into T3, and then the T3 has effect, okay? How does the T4 turn into T3? Through something called a D, Iodinase, we need to take away one iodine, right? So four to three, that's four iodine, that's three. We need to take away a single iodine, iodide residue through an enzyme called a, di, uh, a D-iodinase. D, 
iodinase. Now there's two types, right? You've got type 1 and type 2. So type 1 you're going to find in the kidney and liver and so forth. So kidney, liver. Type 2 you'll find at the brain, pituitary, for example, other areas. So type 1, kidney, liver, whoops, type 2, brain and pituitary. What it does is it takes away an iodine residue, turns T4 to T3. Why am I telling you this? Because at the center of a deiodinase, the enzyme, is another atom that we need called selenium. So I said one atom that we need to produce thyroid hormone is iodine. Now another one, which allows us to turn T4 into the active T3, is selenium. And selenium, I think, is the 34th atom on the periodic table. Again, quite heavy, but also means that our diet must contain selenium in order for us to have an abundant or an adequate level of T3 floating through our bloodstream. Now another thing, we've got T4, T3 floating around, 80% of it is T4, needs to be turned into T3 due to these iodinases, if it's at the liver or kidney or other periphery, it's type 1. If it's going to be happening at the brain, pituitary, it's type 2. Then it's turned to uh, T3. But what you're going to find is that thyroid hormones don't usually float around freely. They need to be bound to a protein. So there are two, well, there's actually three proteins, but I'm only going to talk about the two major binding proteins for thyroid hormone. The most abundant protein is not albumin, but it's something called TBP. TBP is thyroxine binding protein. Thyroxine binding protein. So 80% of thyroid hormone is bound by TBG. T TBP, and the remaining 20-odd percent is through albumin. Okay, now that, if you do the calculations, 80 plus 20 equals 100 percent, that means there's no free floating or free thyroid hormone. That's not true. There is around about 1 percent-ish of thyroid hormone is free floating. Oops, about 1 percent is free hormone. It's the free hormone that has the effect. So only free hormone can do what it needs to do. Okay, go to the tissues, have its particular thyroid hormone based effect. Which means again, you've got 80% of the hormone is T4, but it doesn't do anything needs to be turned to T3. It does this through a deiodinase, which requires selenium. Once it's T3, it can't be bound, but Nearly 100% of thyroid hormone is bound, both T4, T3, through both TBP and albumin, and it needs to be freed in order for it to have its effect. Okay? What all this means is that if you measure thyroid hormone in a laboratory test, there's a couple of things you need to measure. Free hormone is important, right? So you need to measure free hormone, but you also need you also could measure. TBP as well, okay? So once you've got your free, so once this protein has released the thyroid hormone, the thyroid hormone needs to have its effect. So how does it have its effect and what does it do? Well, once it's let go, thyroid hormone will go to the tissues of certain uh, uh, organs or structures of the body goes to the cells, and let's just say we've got a cell here, and remember you've got a bilayer, you've got T3 coming in, in a cell you've got a nucleus, and that nucleus has the DNA. T3 does not have its effect on surface receptors. T3 has its effect inside the cell on the DNA itself. So thyroid hormone works on the DNA and alters transcription. Transcription is whether we are going to read that DNA molecule and make more copies, turn the gene into a protein and then have its effect, 
or not read it. Transcription, okay? So transcription, then translation. So thyroid hormone goes into the cell and actually has its effect on receptors at the DNA itself, altering transcription. Now, what type of transcription is it going to do? Okay, well, it depends on where it goes. So for example, if it goes to the liver, if thyroid hormone goes to the liver, it tells the liver to increase its ability to clear cholesterol. So that the liver increases cholesterol clearance. That means if you don't have enough thyroid hormone, it may lead to cholesterol abundance or accumulation, and this could lead potentially into atherosclerosis. So that means thyroid dysfunction has been associated with atherosclerosis. If thyroid hormone goes to the heart, well, it can tell it to increase contractility, so it's uh, ability to contract hard and its heart rate. That means that thyroid hormone issues can also result potentially in something called atrial fibrillation, increased heart rate. All right? Now, if thyroid hormone goes to other tissues, goes to the bone, it alters uh, bone remodeling, so growth, uh, bone buildup and breakdown. It alters our basal metabolic rate. The basal metabolic rate is how quickly we build things up and break things down. It can alter mental alertness, alter respiration. It can alter many, many different things. Basically, it has global systemic effects throughout the body and has its primary role in growth and development and metabolism. All right. Now, thyroid hormone is so important for the developing fetus that if a mother does not have enough iodine, she's not going to create enough thyroid hormone and that child will have developmental issues. For the fetus, thyroid hormone is required for appropriate nervous system development, which means without thyroid hormone, the fetus does not develop an adequate nervous system and can result in mental retardation. And this is known as cretinism. Cretinism is not enough thyroid hormone for the fetus having problem with the nervous system development. All right, so that's that. We now need to talk about what stimulates this whole process of thyroid hormone production, right? So we don't just eat iodine and then the iodide comes in and then it binds with the thyroglobulin, the thyroglobulin bound with iodine turns into MIT and DIT and then they come together to form T4 and T3 and then they get released. It doesn't just happen, it needs a trigger to tell it to do so and also needs something to tell it to stop. So let's talk about that now. As you should know, the endocrine system has a master regulator and that master regulator is the hypothalamus. So the hypothalamus you know is in the brain. You're going to have the hypothalamus, which is around about there. It's going to have, so let's just draw the hypothalamus here. You've got the pituitary glands with the anterior and posterior pituitary glands. And what we want to look at here is the anterior pituitary gland, right? This is the anterior pituitary gland. And the anterior pituitary gland has a number of hormones, but the only hormone we want to talk about today is a hormone called thyroid stimulating hormone, known as TSH. That's the hormone produced and released by the anterior pituitary gland, but the, thy uh, the hypothalamus itself, it needs to release a hormone to tell the anterior pituitary gland to release TSH, and this is called thyrotropin releasing hormone. What a wonderful name, thyrotropin releasing hormone. Thyrotropin releasing hormone, also known as TRH. How do you remember these two? Because they sound similar, thyrotropin releasing hormone and thyroid stimulating hormone. Okay, the thyroid stimulating hormone stimulates the thyroid. This is the hormone released from the anterior pituitary gland, travel through the bloodstream, go to the thyroid, and it stimulates this whole thing to occur. In actual fact, TSH controls every level of this process. It stimulates iodine concentration in the colloid, it stimulates the binding of iodine with thyroglobulin, stimulates T4, T3 production, and T4, T3 release into the bloodstream. TSH controls all of that. But it will only be released if the hypothalamus tells it to be released. And the th hypothalamus releases thyrotropin releasing hormone. Thyrotropin. If a hormone has tropin on the end, it's telling you that it's going to tell another gland to release another hormone. 
So it's a hormone that ultimately tells another gland to release another hormone. So that's why it's called thyrotropin because it's traveling to another gland, the anterior pituitary, to release its hormone, which is TSH. So that is released by the hypothalamus, goes to the anterior pituitary gland, which will release TSH. That'll travel to the thyroid gland to release its hormone, which is thyroid hormone, T4, T3, which will travel around the body and control growth, development, metabolism, with a couple of other things. All right. This whole process is regulated by negative feedback. All right. Now, remember I told you that you're going to have T4 and T3 floating around the body with the majority of it, 99% of it, all right, bound to proteins, which are TBP and albumin, with around about 1% free. Okay. If the levels of these increase, if T4 or T3, predominantly T4, but if T4 or T3 go, levels go too high, they, because they're floating through the bloodstream, will ultimately get here to the anterior pituitary gland and it will negatively regulate the release of TSH. So if T4, T3 levels get too high, it tells TSH, hey, don't be released, which means this process slows down and then there's less T4, T3, okay? Now, in actual fact, what can happen? It's basically the free levels that stimulate this process, okay? The free levels, if the free levels get too high. This is important because you could have increased T4, T3, right? Increased levels, but if you remain at 1% free, right? So let's just say we normally, we have 50 units we have, we, okay, let's say 100 units. We have 100 units of T4, T3 floating around the body bound to TBP and albumin, and we have one unit that's free, all right? It's this one unit that will go back and feed and say, hey, it's okay. If that one unit increases to five units, but we still have 100 units bound here, that is going to tell it to inhibit, stop. We've got too much floating around. But what's going to happen is if the ratio increases and that goes to 500 units and that goes to 5 units, the ratio has remained the same, right? And it's, you're going to have what's called a euthyroid effect. The thyroid basically maintains its current function, okay? So it's all about that ratio. All right. Last thing I want to talk about is hyper and hypothyroidism. So let's have a look first at hyper. Hyper thyroidism. Okay, the hyper means more than. And so it's basically hyperthyroidism is the increased production of T4, T3. Right? Increased production of T4, T3, and this is usually due to increased uh, stimulation of thyroid gland. Now, what stimulates the thyroid gland? TSH. So usually this is due to increased TSH. What increases TSH? The anterior pituitary and often it's due to certain cancers, so adenomas or growths. So um, cancers, growths of pituitary gland. And the reason why this is the case is because if TSH increases and increases T4, T3, there should be a negative feedback. So that should come back and say, hey, stop being released. But if it's a cancer or some sort of tumor or adenoma, for example, it doesn't listen to those, um, those signals. That's actually one of the cardinal signs of cancers is that it doesn't listen to signals coming from the body telling it to be regulated. So cancer, the pituitary, can increase TSH, which stimulates the thyroid gland, increase in production T4, T3, and this is called hyperthyroidism. All right? But, the, but this isn't the most common cause of hyperthyroidism, okay? The most common cause of hyperthyroidism is something called Gray's disease. 
most common, or at least the most common in Western countries, Graves' disease, and it's autoimmune. Now, what actually happens is that antibodies, that, so autoimmune means your body is recognizing yourself as foreign and is attacking it. So what actually happens is antibodies that your body's producing goes to those follicular cells, right? Goes to particular receptors on them that TSH would bind to, binds to those TSH receptors, and mimic the role of TSH and keep telling it to produce more and produce more and produce more thyroid hormone. That's Graves' disease. So what you need is some sort of competing antibodies that can bind to those receptors competitively and inhibit from stimulating it. That's Graves'. What about hypothyroidism? Well, in hypothyroidism, that's obviously going to be an underproduction. So let's change this. Hypothyroidism is a decreased production of T4 and T3. Now, you can have primary hypothyroidism or secondary hypothyroidism. So primary hypothyroidism Primary hypothyroidism is if you've got a decreased production T4, T3, and it's due to problems with the gland itself, okay? Primary gland itself not producing T4, T3. Secondary hypothyroidism is because something is inhibiting that gland from releasing it. Something else inhibiting gland. This may be due to decreased TSH release, which means if you can fix this, so with these secondary issues, it usually means that if you can fix the underlying cause, the gland will start to produce normal amounts. So this again can be due to certain cancers or disorders or tumors which negatively impact the release of TSH. Okay, that's a secondary cause. Primary, where the gland itself is not doing it, well, one of the most common causes of hypothyroidism is something called Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Hashimoto's thyroiditis. And again, most common cause of hypothyroidism. And again, it's an autoimmune disorder in which antibodies are coming along, binding to those TSH receptors and other areas and actually destroying the thyroid tissue. So instead of stimulating it like it does in Graves' disease, it destroys the tissue. And if the tissue is destroyed, then no T4, no T3. And that means the tissue can't produce anything. Okay, so that's Hashimoto's. Now, what are the signs and symptoms? Well, if you have hyperthyroidism, that usually results in a goiter. Now, a goiter is this uh, over um, the volume. So remember when I drew these follicular cells surrounding that colloid, okay? So because there's numerous ones of these, if you start producing more and more and more and more T4, T3, then this colloid, this fluid, starts to get larger and larger in volume because there's more stuff in it. If they get larger and larger, that means parts of the gland, nodules of the gland start to form and it starts to protrude and it usually protrudes anterior laterally and you get this side um, distension of the thyroid gland itself, usually due to a hyperthyroidism. However, you can have a hypothyroid goiter and this is caused due to not enough iodine So in your diet. So if you don't have enough iodine in your diet, remember what happens is you need iodine to come in and you need the production of thyroid globulin, and then they come together and produce thyroid hormone. But if you don't have enough iodine in your diet, what happens is you produce thyroid globulin, but you're not producing T4, so it sends a signal to your brain saying, hey, there's not enough thyroid hormone, stimulate TRH release, stimulate TSH release, release comes in and tries to promote more of this coming in but there's no iodine to come in, but it still stimulates thyroglobulin production. So you start getting this increased level of thyroglobulin in the colloid, and the colloid starts to grow in volume, even though you've got no iodine in. And because you're still not producing T4, 
it keeps going back to the central nervous system telling it keep producing keep producing and you've got this cyclical thing occurring in which you produce too much colloid and again a goid is being produced so you can have a goiter for hyperthyroidism too much colloid produced because too much hormones produced or you can have a goiter being produced because of not enough iodine now this was the most common cause of goiter but what you'll find is that now we have our food fortified with iodine and you may see on your table iodized salt that iodized salt is to get enough iodine into your diet regardless of where you are on the planet whether you have enough in your diet or not enough in your diet all right now there's other things that happen so if you have hyperthyroidism it stimulates metabolic function and so you get increased sweating you have increased body temperature increased weight loss for example and you can have these uh, ocular protrusions because it alters the tissue at the back of your eyes thickens starts to push it out as well for hypothyroidism because of the metabolic effects you tend to gain weight you tend to get cold for example the fat gets redistributed around your body you can get fat at the back of the neck called a buffalo hump you can get uh, uh, larger cheeks due to fatty depositions and so forth okay so this is the thyroid gland and the thyroid hormones that are produced Hopefully you enjoyed it, let me know.